Looking around at the world, it's easy to feel defeated or in despair. We aren't the first people to feel this way. Centuries ago, God's people were taken into exile under hostile rulers. Yet God equipped them not only to survive, but to thrive. Through the book of Daniel, God invites us to do the same, shining like stars in the midst of the darkness. Well, that's the hope, right? We want to thrive, not survive. Welcome everybody once again. It's awesome to be together. And if you're brand new with us, man, I know you've already been blessed and I'm so grateful that you're here. We are just always opening our arms and inviting uh, God to bring into our family whoever he sees fit. So if you're new with us, man, we're so thrilled that you're with us today. I, want, I was wondering, have you ever had a time where you just felt like completely out of place, way different than everybody else you were around? You ever had a time like that? I, I heard a story a few years back about this couple who moved into a new neighborhood. They were getting to know their neighbors. They were trying to, you know, be friendly and figure out, because you don't know when you get a house. You don't, you don't get to do interviews first, right? So you, you figure that out later. But they're going around checking out the neighborhood, getting to know people. And some of their neighbors said, hey, we're actually down the street. They're having a party this weekend uh, with some of the neighbors. Why don't you guys come? And it's a dress up party. So, you know, you should come and, and just don't, this, these people are serious about dressing up. So just do that. And they're like, okay, well, it was early fall. So they thought it was a little premature for like a costume party, but whatever. Like that's what they do in this neighborhood. They want to leave a good impression. So they, they went to work on their outfits and they decided to go to the party as a duo. They were the Nintendo characters, Mario and Princess Peach. And that's what they decided to go as, all right? So they're, you know, they got all decked out, like pink dress. Mario's got his big red hat and bib overalls and all that. And they, they roll up and they realized immediately when they got in the front door that dress up does not equal costume party. <laughs> they looked around the room and everybody's there. All the guys are wearing like a suit with a tie. The ladies are wearing like an evening dress. And they walked in basically looking like this. This is kind of what they looked like when they went in. So... Little bit different than what they were expecting. They certainly made a first impression. And I think it's safe to say they felt a little different that night and maybe not so much uh, in your life. Maybe it's not a dinner party thing. Maybe it's in other areas of your life. But I would like to suggest to you today that actually being different is kind of the point. That there are times in our lives, especially when we are taking our lordship from Jesus, that we have to decide or choose to be different. Then last week we launched into this teaching series through the book of Daniel, the Old Testament book of Daniel, this incredible story, an example after example of faithfulness to God in the midst of trials through the life of Daniel and his friends, these young men who were enslaved by a foreign nation. They're thrown into a cultural challenges left and right, coming face to face with things that go against their faith. And they had to decide what they were gonna do. Which, by the way, we're doing a reading plan as a church through the book of Daniel. Um, if you want to jump on the reading plan, it starts tomorrow. And you can uh, just scan the QR code if you'd like to do that. But this is a chance for us to uh, read along the story. If you haven't started reading Daniel, which I'm sure you have because it's so interesting. But if you haven't, you can start tomorrow. And you can also select on Version. This is the app we use for our digital like notes and also to read the Bible. You can select at your own church on there now. So you can go on there, find Cornerstone. Anytime we have a reading plan, it'll notify you that we have a new reading plan. So check that out. Daniel and his friends had to decide how they were gonna live in the midst of the nation of Babylon. And what we said last week is that Babylon is not only the nation that existed in the sixth century. Babylon today is a mindset. Babylon represents a worldview that has permeated popular culture in our world and it regularly comes clashing or face to face with the Christian faith. So this series is hopefully setting up followers of Jesus to navigate what it looks like, not just to survive and get by, but to thrive in the midst of the challenging world we live in, looking at the example of Daniel and his friends. We started asking this question last week. How can we thrive as followers of Jesus in a world that is increasingly far from him? It, it seems like it's moving further and further away. How do we actually thrive in that? And the life of Daniel is an example for us 
now almost 3,000 years later, we can still glean so much from his life. We left off last week in Daniel chapter one, verse eight, Daniel one eight was the hinge verse between ending one storyline and starting a new one. And Daniel one eight says this, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat those unacceptable, these unacceptable foods. That's the hinge, okay? Today we're looking at the entire story about the royal foods, but I already love how this story starts. Remember, Daniel and his friends are like 15 years old probably. They are in this three-year internship where they're, gonna, they're toward the beginning of their time there. They have no homeland to speak of anymore. They have no real future, at least not what they ever dreamed. They, they had their names changed. They had their identity challenged. They have constant messages and brainwashing coming at them in the form of Babylon, which is talking about its superiority and all the cultural things about Babylon that are so great, which in many ways are contradictory to their Hebrew faith. What do they do when they run into those kind of challenges? And we, for the first time, see them actually take a stand. They sort of draw a line in the sand and go, we can't go there. And verse eight, they were different and they had decided that on this point, it was time to lean into that difference. And here's the reality that all of us have got to understand. Being different most often precedes making a difference. If you want to make a difference, most often you have to start by being different. That God calls us to something that is different if we want to see a difference on the other side. Daniel and his friends were not trying to just survive. They were thriving in Babylon. They were going to make a difference. And here we all are still talking about them 2,700 years later. And this became a situation that challenged them to their very core, and it started with food. Now, each day, these men, well, these young men would be trained, and they would be fed from the royal chefs. So in Babylon, this is as good a eats as you get, right? This is top quality food, prepared really well. But the food in Babylon would have certainly been filled with plenty of things that were off limits to these young Hebrew boys, according to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they give very clear instructions for Israel about what they can and can't eat. And one of those things is pork. They would have definitely been served pork. Another one probably is that any of the meats they would have been given were likely sacrificed to idols before they were served. So they would cook them and sacrifice the meat to idols. That's a no-no for these Hebrew boys. So they, they run into this first big test how are they going to respond? Are they going to conform and just eat it and literally and just not worry about it like we don't know? Or are they going to respond in a way that's going to honor God in the faith that they know they're trying to live out? What would they do? Daniel kindly requests to have a different menu. I saw a picture that a guy painted in the 1800s of this scene. Uh, somebody drew this of Daniel refusing. There he is, Daniel refusing the food. Amazingly Caucasian Daniel. <laughs> He's giving the stop in the name of love symbol to his superior. I don't know if it was quite like this, okay? This is somebody's rendition, but it probably would have been, I'm guessing, a tad annoying to the chief of staff because if you've ever tried to feed more than about three people, you know how difficult it is when one person is like, I don't eat that. You're like, oh. Seriously, it's so challenging, but Daniel made a choice to honor God with his food. He chose to be different, and he knew this was a place that he had to live out his faith. So verse nine continues in the story just a bit and gives us some more insights. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Daniel had earned affection and respect from the chief of staff. There's some folks who um, in more recent years have looked at this whole story and they've tried to reproduce this diet. It's called the Daniel Plan. You can find it online. And if you know, you're thinking like, I knew it, processed meat is from the devil, that the way of the Lord is only vegetables or something. Maybe it's just a tad bit of a stretch, but it is available. And God's dietary laws for Israel were based on health. They were based on worshiping him as God alone. And Daniel and company knew they would violate their covenant with God if they gave in to the food thing. They knew that was a place they had to draw the line. And somehow, despite the potential consequences that they could face, they had built enough of a relationship and talked the attendant into giving it a try. 
this was pretty different. Like this guy already showed them favor. So the first big key for us here, guys, is that we ought to learn to be different by being distinct, not by being self-righteous or obnoxious. Can we just go ahead and represent and know that we don't have to be obnoxious and we don't have to be know-it-alls in order to represent God in the way we make decisions? Making a difference, being distinct, it doesn't have to be always off-putting. And maybe you've, maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've heard Christian people who love the Lord, who have said or done things that kind of make you cringe. Has anybody experienced that before? You're like, oh, please don't say it like that. Right? You, maybe you listened to a, a Christian coworker who's trying to share their faith with, with somebody in your office or something. And they're like, you know what I'm going to do this week? I'm just going to bathe you in prayer. I'm going to bathe you in prayer all week. And the person is not saying it out loud, but they're thinking, please don't bathe me in anything. I don't know what that means. Don't do that, right? Because sometimes some of the words we use or phrases, it can be off-putting. And Daniel is, obviously, he has built a relationship with these people to the point where they respect him. He's earned their trust and respect. And yes, sometimes the very decision to not conform to something that you know dishonors God can create a stir. This is not a perfect formula. This is a mindset and approach to how we build relationships. There is really no reason for followers of Jesus to be obnoxious, to be overly loud all the time. Certainly, we don't ever need to come across as better than everybody else because we happen to have the amazing truth of God. As far as we can tell, and I think the text really suggests this, Daniel was kind, friendly, patient and understanding with the chief of staff and the attendant. He even actually built enough of a relationship that these guys liked him. They let him try something that was not in the handbook. That's not what they were supposed to do. And I got to think part of it is because he was not a jerk know-it-all who bemoaned the horrible diet that he was forced to eat every day. He didn't treat it like that. He had a bigger picture in mind, learning to thrive instead of just survive, which always honors God when we're trying to put him first and navigate whatever situation we're in. Certainly the people around him and his things were a trial, was difficult at times. The text says that God gave Daniel and his friends ultimately respect and affection, or Daniel had respect and affection from the chief of staff. The rest of his life is an indicator and we're gonna look at most of it. Daniel did not spend much energy picking fights. He didn't pick very many fights. Instead, he found other ways to honor God first and treat the people around him with value and worth. Here's the thing, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the chief of staff, the attendant, the whole bunch of Babylonians, they were also created in the image of God. They are deeply loved by God. And if, despite horrible things that they have done, and they did horrible things, they murdered a bunch of Hebrews. They stole the good ones out of the country and brought them to Babylon. They took all the stuff out of the temple of God, the place of worship. They took it all to their pagan temple. They did all these bad things. If God loved them that much, then why would Daniel not treat them with kindness and respect? Of course he should. Did he agree with everything they believed or everything they did? No, he did not. But he chose to find ways to keep loving them and not be completely obtrusive in the way he interacted with them. I don't know of one example ever where somebody came to Christ by being shamed. Ever. Nobody ever goes, you have put me down so many times, I now surrender to the love of Jesus. Like, (laughs) that never happens. So why would we think that that's the way God wants us to interact, that we just prove our point by being right and loud and sort of obnoxious, right? More often than not, people are loved in and prayed into the hands of Jesus, so that should be our posture too. That's how we're different. We're also different by conforming to Scripture, not to culture. This is so critical. We're gonna spend a few minutes here, right? People who belong to Jesus are supposed to be distinct. And if we think and speak and live like everybody else, it looks like Jesus makes really no difference at all. We can be really kind and nice and everything, but then not actually be different in the way that we live, and we've also missed the point. Daniel provides a powerful example of how to be faithfully distinct in the midst of a culture that is shifting a totally different direction. So the tension, of course, is, well, when are we supposed to do that 
to maintain our distinction from the world? And when is it fine to kind of feel normal or be just American or whatever? Like, how do we know when we're supposed to do that? Well, Daniel models it about as well as anybody in scripture does. And we can follow the principles that he lived out. He found ways to exist in his culture without caving on the things that are critical to God's word. That's really where the line is. We don't go against God's ways and God's word in order to sort of go along with the culture we live in. Now, look at, listen to this uh, statistic that I found this week. <clears throat> they did an interview, uh, Gallup, big pollster, did an interview of Americans. 62% of the ones they interviewed said they were themselves deeply spiritual. These are people that say, I am deeply spiritual, right? Among the people that were at the top of that rung, deeply spiritual all the way down to not spiritual at all. They took the deeply spiritual people and they asked them another series of questions. And they said, how much does your deeply spiritual life affect your decision making? And the conclusion, here, here's the conclusion, if you break it down, 31% of them said, I make my moral choices based on what feels right and what's comfortable. 18% of the very deeply spiritual people said, I make moral choices based on whatever is best for me, according to me. 14% of them said, I make more choice, moral choices based on whatever causes the least conflict with other people. Do you see a problem so far? All these deeply spiritual people who are listening to themselves for whatever conclusion they have, only 16% of them said, I make my moral choices based on what the Bible, God's word says. 16% of the deeply spiritual people. And that may surprise you, it may not. Here's the thing, our version of Babylon today is in fact deeply spiritual and interested in spiritual things, but for the most part, it is not grounded in biblical truth. The followers of Jesus have to be different. Beyond all the other influences, it should be God's word that directs our decisions day in and day out. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, what a great verse. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do, nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Be strong and immovable. Isn't that great language? That is just somebody you can just know they're hunkered down. They are not gonna get pushed over by whatever wave come crashing on, comes crashing on them. And notice again, it does not say, but you may need to be really belligerent and annoying. It doesn't say that. He's talking about character and decisions. Friends, we simply cannot conform to the pattern of the world around us when it contradicts the things of God and think God will just sort of understand, like he knows how it is, right? He knows how, this is just how it is these days. No, he's called us to something much bigger and much higher. He's called us to a life of holiness, which is different. It is distinct. It is gonna feel unique. I did a wedding a few weeks ago, two young people that grew up in our church. They dated for five years. And during that entire time, they were trying to take, I mean, from high school on, they were trying to take every effort they could to figure out how to honor God in their relationship. They honored God every step along the way, including honoring God with their bodies. They saved themselves physically for marriage as scripture teaches us to do. And so, we talked about that leading up to their wedding. And I, in their wedding, I said that. I told everybody at the wedding, they saved themselves for this day. And I think some people were a little surprised that I mentioned that. And somebody talked to me after the wedding and they said, I was really surprised you brought that up. I'm like, yeah, that was important to them. So it's important to me. And this person said like, well, I didn't really think that many people did that anymore. You know, like, well, you might be right. It may not be normal, but they decided a long time ago they wanted to honor God and ask him to bless their life and their path together. So they decided to do it God's way. And I don't tell that story to shame anybody who's made a different choice. I tell you that to encourage you to not cave to the temptation and the worldview of Babylon because Babylon is always gonna tell you a different way, but to pursue instead the truth of God in your life and conform and be shaped by his word. And it sometimes feels like you're dressed like Mario at a dinner party with suits. It's just gonna feel like that sometimes. And Daniel was convicted by the power of God in his life. He knew God's word. He was walking with God and wanted to honor him. And he knew he wanted to make a difference however God was gonna use him. His convictions, listen, convictions are most often not about making a conviction in the moment. 
Convictions are made before the moment comes. Daniel knew he couldn't eat the food that was going to be passed to him long before the plate came out of the kitchen because he had conviction on God's word. And then his faith in the moment gave him the ability to act on those convictions and actually get pretty creative in the midst of building a good relationship with the people he was around. And we can't build up that sort of resolve and conviction. We can't build it up if we don't know God's word. If we don't make every effort to let this shape and guide us, it just ends up being a book of suggestions that we consider occasionally and hope Chris tells us something good today. Right? Instead of our lifeline for every part of faith and life giving us the conviction to learn how to be different in the midst of the culture of Babylon that we live in. It plays out in other ways too. Let's say you're starting a new career and you're going to get a job and you're going to go figure out what you're going to do. And if you approach the workforce or, you know, you retire and you start a new career and you're thinking to yourself like, I'm going to go do this thing. In the worldview of Babylon, you might say to yourself, I want a job that's going to make me the most money and give me the most freedom. Sounds great. Make a bunch of money, have a bunch of freedom. But if you're conforming to God's ways, you would ask a different set of questions first. You might ask a question like, what career path or what job would use my gifts and my experience and my abilities to have the greatest kingdom impact, that I can actually make the biggest difference with other people. It shapes how you think and what questions you ask when we're conformed first to God's word. It shapes how you handle money. If you handle money God's way, you are often gonna feel behind other people who have the same career and make the same amount of money. Do you know why you feel behind with the amount of money that you have when you do it God's way? Because you're behind with the amount of money that you have when you do it God's way. If you're giving 10% to God, you've got 10% left to spend on yourself, right? And then living generously on top of that and finding ways to bless other people, you're gonna be a little bit behind what the rest of Babylon looks like. But then again, you aren't being conformed to the modern Babylon, which by the way tells you you need to live above your means. And if you want something, you just put it on the credit card, no big deal. It's only like 47% interest every day. It's not a big deal. There's a reason why every massive bank building is immaculate, right? It came from somewhere. And it doesn't consider honoring the one who gave us the resources to begin, to begin with. On the other end of the spectrum, you're thinking about what you're gonna do for retirement. And in Babylon, your goal might be, how do we save enough to eventually quit everything, play golf all day, and sit around and do nothing. Right? That might be the perspective, not when you're conformed to God's word. That's not the point. Instead, you probably ask something like, how can we set ourselves up now so that when we get to a different season of life, we will be able to give more financially and give more time and energy in greater ways to the movement of the kingdom of God? How can we do that even better in those seasons? See, it's a different mindset. And the only way we develop that sort of mindset, whether it's starting with how you handle your body or handle your money or your career, is when we are digging into and living out God's word, not the culture around us. You're never gonna get that kind of coaching in Babylon. And sometimes what that means is that you're gonna face some trials and feel like Mario. It's just going to be a little bit of a challenge sometimes. It's going to clash eventually. It's bound to happen. So what do we do? Well, we make sure that when we're different, we're different by trusting God and giving him credit through every test. We're going to face some tests. We're going to face some trials. We're going to have these moments where we shouldn't eat it, but everybody else is eating it. Are we going to eat it? or whatever version of the trial is for you. Daniel had his fair share of them. We're gonna look at a bunch of them, but interestingly, this very first one, he just decided to embrace it. He just kind of leaned into it. Now, the chief of staff showed Daniel favor, and then the story continues in verse 10. The chief of staff guy responds, I am afraid of the Lord my king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. And if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Pretty serious stuff. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he says, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. 
Sounds terrible, doesn't it? At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food and then make your decision in light of what you see. And the attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days, and I may add, at the risk of losing his own head. This is a pretty bold move that Daniel takes, but he knew his faith was gonna be put to the test. It was inevitable. It was bound to happen. He's going to run face to face into a clash. So Daniel just, instead of trying to avoid the discomfort, took advantage of the moment. He took a bold move. He looked at an opportunity to live out his faith and he came up with a creative solution. Why 10 days? Well, it actually doesn't say, but is it an arbitrary number? Likely not an arbitrary number. Throughout scripture, the number 10 represents the testing of faithfulness a number of different times. For example, when we're given the, Israel's trying to figure out, are they really gonna honor God and walk with him? And God gives them the 10 commandments. That wasn't everything he told them. That was like the Cliff's notes of what he told them, right? 10 commandments to test their faithfulness. We're called to give 10% back to God. That's a test of our faithfulness. After Jesus went to heaven, the disciples gathered around and kind of went, what do we do now? And they stayed in the upper room and they prayed for 10 days before they launched into their next season of ministry. It was a test of faithfulness. In the book of Revelation, there's a church called Smyrna. Smyrna was trying to figure out, are we in this thing with Jesus or not? And they were tested with 10 days of direct persecution. There's example after example of that sort of season of 10 being a test of faithfulness. And Daniel knew push was gonna come to shove. It was inevitable, so he just embraced it. And instead of scraping his leftovers into the dog bowl and pretending like he didn't like pork, he just decided to use it as an opportunity and find a creative way to live out his faith. Friends, whenever culture shifts, which is like every day, your faith's gonna be tested. I mean, the enemy is gonna look for every opportunity to redirect faith and shift our worldview. Every chance he has, he has no problem setting traps to discourage or distract us at every turn. And every time our faith is tested, it's an opportunity for him to attack. But here's the great thing about a test. A test could be negative and be a setback, maybe even cause us to walk away from God for a season. Or a test could be an opportunity for growth and faith. We aren't always quick to celebrate tests and trials, are we? Like, God, please, I don't have very many trials right now. Would you bring a few trials into my life? I'd really like to grow in my, no. But trials and tests, man, they can be a great thing. In fact, listen how James, the brother of Jesus, who didn't believe in him until after the resurrection, James said this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, everybody say any kind, any kind of trial comes your way, any kind, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Every kind of trial. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance actually has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, not needing anything or needing nothing. I'm sure Daniel, in the midst of it, we don't have this, but I'm sure he thought it one day, like, God, why are you letting this happen? After all we've already been through, isn't it enough that we don't have a family or identity anymore? And you're gonna make us make a decision about food? Why couldn't you just have the Babylonians enjoy a salad bar so we could pretend? Like, why, why the food? But it was through the testing that Daniel developed deeper faith. He developed stronger endurance in the test. The test like this let God prove himself to us over and over. He's right there in it. And he so often shows up huge. He shows up huge in these moments. The tendency is to wanna to ask God, Lord, please protect me from any trials, any tests, any issues with people about my faith. Like, I just don't wanna go there. And when we pray that way and think that way, we are essentially asking God to help us not grow. Instead, we should ask God to help guide us through the trial, walk with us more, show himself to us, help us trust him more. And then when we see the hand of God through the trial on the other side, we give God the glory, not just getting us through, we're not trying to survive, but deepening us in the process so that we can thrive. Tests are a part of maturing in faith. 
how we respond to it is what's critical. The great reformer Martin Luther once said it like this, the courage of the soldier is tested in how well he stands where the battle is the hottest, not in how brave he postures himself when the battle has passed. In the trial. So what are we going to do with the difficulties and the tests? Are we going to embrace it and put on our hope in the hand of God, or are we going to minimize the test and try to wish it away? Well, Daniel doesn't do that. In fact, look at verse 15 as the story concludes. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. And when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. And no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. That's about 63 more years. Pretty fascinating turn of events. Potential death for the attendant at the beginning, heads getting chopped off, all the way to now the highest level of respect with the king at the end. Because Daniel and his friends were willing to be different in order to make a difference. And here's the crazy cool thing about this. Guys, honoring God most often comes all, always comes back around to honoring you. It's not a perfect formula. That's not the way God set it up for us to do it because of that. There are certainly stories of persecution where, unlike this story, somebody, you know, you don't always get gifts and accolades like Daniel did, 10 times more wisdom. But when you live differently and honor God with your life, you see his hand of blessing all through every step. He always comes back around and finds ways to honor us when we honor him. So what's it gonna be? Are we willing to be different, to make a difference? Because that's the example of Daniel and that's the call of Jesus in my life and yours. Let's pray. Lord, in your incredible kindness and in your incredible mercy, you've seen fit to call us your children, to invite us into relationship with you. Thank you, thank you, God, that through the trials, you're not only there, you are deepening us, you're giving us more resolve and you're strengthening us. And may we, like Daniel, look at the culture around us, not with a chip on our shoulder, not with a grumpy attitude, not with disgust, certainly not toward the people that you love that are walking far away from you. Instead, God, would you help us to be resolved on your word, conformed by that in our lives and not by culture, and to in turn show people your love and the way we love them and the way we act each and every day. We pray in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.